Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Fifth Estate at the Wheeler Centre. My name is Sally Warhaft, and it's a pleasure to be with you here again, uh, live streaming. And this evening, uh, we're particularly lucky to have with us as our guest, Tom Porteous. Tom is a Deputy Director at, uh, Program Director at Human Rights Watch. He formerly worked uh, in journalism, in diplomacy, um, and uh, United Nations peacekeeping. And some of you uh, regulars to the Fifth Estate might remember uh, Tom was with us in Melbourne five years ago now. And um, I remember uh, the conversation with him uh, really well. I, I remember uh, him for uh, his kindness and compassion um, and uh, an incredible insight into the issue of human rights. And so it is just such a pleasure um, to welcome you back again, Tom. Hello. Hi. And uh, you're joining us from Paris and uh, um, even, even better to um, have you there. Uh, across the pond. If you can't be here, you were meant to be coming to Melbourne in late March and, uh, and you were going to be a guest here and in particular to talk about uh, the anniversary of um, the, the, the fifth anniversary of the war in Yemen. And I thought tonight um, we could just start by touching on that country and because one of the things, of course, that happened with the coronavirus um, is that it swept everything else away and uh, crises um, and disputes and problems all over the world that have suddenly just seemingly disappeared. So I thought we could start with asking you, what do you know of what is happening in Yemen uh, with coronavirus? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, the um, crises have disappeared from uh, our television screens and our newspapers um, on the whole, but they uh, are continuing. So in Yemen, you still have war, you have a humanitarian and economic crisis, you have a large population of displaced people living in precarious conditions in camps dependent on foreign aid for food and medical assistance. But actually, this aid has been much reduced recently. Uh, you have a, a collapse of normal public life, political life within the country, which is um, uh, divided between the north and the south, you have competing political factions. Uh, you also have porous borders with immigrant flows from uh, Africa uh, into the Gulf via Yemen. And you have uh, really a weak to non-existent health service. Um, uh, you've had recent flooding in some parts of the country and you've got a long-running drought at the same time. So it's really like the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Um, and so, ex you know, the country is really exhausted by years of conflict. Um, uh, so not only do many Yemenis have a sort of lower, lowered uh, physiological immune systems, but metaphorically speaking, the country itself has a very weak uh, immune system. Uh, uh, and therefore is very vulnerable to COVID. Um, it's very hard to predict, I think, what will happen in Yemen with COVID because there's still an awful lot we don't know about the virus. Uh, there's also uh, very little information coming out uh, from Yemen. Uh, officially, the infection and, and death uh, rate figures for Yemen are still quite low relative to many other countries. But just in recent weeks, it looks like it, the virus has started to spread quite significantly. And uh, there's a real fear that things could get very, very bad there because of the lack of any sort of uh, serious health system. Uh, I think that the, the, the main point here is that, that, that the COVID pandemic has a way of exposing uh, the fault lines in societies, as well as in our system of, of global governance. And Yemen is certainly a very fragile fault line and there are other situations of conflict um, and uh, political collapse um, where I think we're also going to see, uh, if the virus takes hold, uh, really serious problems. Uh, Syria is one example, uh, Libya is another, uh, and the list is, is, is really all too long. Um, the list of things to, to worry about in terms of human rights impact is also... Um far too long as well, but what what worries you the very most in in regard to um, the coronavirus and and human rights? 
Um, I think I think that there are sort of two uh, big things uh, that, um, that 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 worry worry me, um, but also I think that they are sort of opportunities uh, for human rights. Um, if I could start with the the the, the, the opportunity, um, uh, and if you know, I think one can make a sort of uh, an interesting analogy with. Um, with the Great Depression um, in the 1920s. Uh, the Great Depression, um, you know, was a, a massive economic shock that triggered a change in thinking about sort of economic and social uh, relations that led to the, the New Deal and the creation of the welfare state. Um, now, these developments weren't specifically framed in, in terms of human rights at the time, but none they let, nonetheless, I think they led to objective advances um, in economic and social rights during the second half of the, of the century when those rights started to be formulated um, and recognized in international treaties. Um, uh, and uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 so, so right now we're facing a, a, a problem with, um, you know, the, the economic impact of the, uh, of the coronavirus, which could be enormous, but it could also be an opportunity for uh, re-examining uh, the social contract uh, between governments and the governed and to put in place a society that is actually fairer and more respectful of human rights. At the same time, the Great Depression obviously led to uh, uh, the catastrophe of the rise of fascism, military expansionism, the collapse of uh, international cooperation, the Second World War and all the horrors that came from that. Uh, and so I think we need to be uh, worried um, and vigilant uh, about, about the potential political fallout. And uh, I think the role uh, of, uh, of all of us really uh, in, uh, in the human rights movement is to, is to be uh, doubling down, if you like, on... Uh, the need for protection for political and civil rights um, in, in, in case that the, the shock that uh, the coronavirus has, uh, has created in the world leads to further political deterioration in the world, further rise of, uh, uh, of, uh, of the sort of populist uh, tendencies that we've been see, seeing recently of uh, governments that are turning their backs on, on, on human rights. So I think that, you know, we're really at a sort of hinge moment in history at the moment with the, with the coronavirus. Um, and uh, it's, 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 a, it's a moment where everyone has uh, a role to play, um, basically to take sides and, and to start working for what they really believe in. Uh, because, uh, you know, to use that sort of rather overquoted uh, phrase that I think is attributed to uh, Edmund Burke, the Anglo-Irish... Um, uh, political thinker of the 18th century, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. This uh, emergence of the, the sort of nationalism, it, it, it was already there, of course, in many places um, in the world before the coronavirus hit. And um, tell us your thoughts, particularly in America, uh, with Trump, um, and are you surprised by what's happened um, with the, the just the devastating toll um, in the United States, and and the response to it? Um, can you talk a bit about that, but also um, how how significant is that failure of leadership in the United States um, in terms of the response of the rest of the world uh, to the to the virus? Um, look, am I surprised? I mean, I'm afraid I'm not that surprised. Um, but, you know, look, the, 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 the United States is the richest country in the world with the most powerful military in the world, and yet it has the highest infection and death roll rate in the world. So I think it will take time and study to sort of really analyze why. But, I mean, I think it's worth making a couple of points. Um, first of all, uh, you know, as, with, as in Yemen, that the, the, the pandemic has exposed in the US some very serious pre-existing economic and social problems. Um, 
and they have to do with with inequality really and, and these you know predate the trump administration so you have inequalities based on social and economic status on race obviously on gender these are very historical problems in the united states um, so as a result the worst hit by the coronavirus in um, United States include a long list of, 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 of people who are living in very precarious circumstances. And, you know, I, I've been living in the United States for, for the past eight years. And, you know, I was really, I've been shocked really to sort of coming from Europe where you have a fairly well functioning uh, welfare system. Um, you know, in the United States, uh, people are very vulnerable to the kind of shock that they're seeing now. Those on low income or part-time uh, jobs or without jobs at all, those living in precarious housing where sort of social distancing or working from home is next to impossible, um, where people are one pay check short of eviction. Um, you have women who may face increased risk of domestic violence under the lockdown. That's actually a problem that is not just in the United States, it's everywhere. Um, people um, having even bigger uh, uh, obstacles than usual, juggling work with childcare because of the lockdown, uh, people incarcerated in, in the United States, notoriously uh, overpopulated um, and unsanitary prisons, uh, undocumented migrants, um, many of whom the Trump administration has decided to deport on the on pretext of protecting public health and American jobs. The more than 30 million people who have, in the United States who've lost their jobs since the start of the pandemic, um, millions living in the United States without health insurance, without savings, without a safety net, um, people who have pre-existing conditions like diabetes, high blood pressure, and so on, who tend to be poor and black, um, people who don't have access to good health care because of what you have in a system in the United States, which is a mainly for-profit health system that doesn't cater to the needs of the poor, uh, and even many middle, middle class people. Um, uh, kids for whom the lockdown means no education at all because they don't have access to the internet, the homeless, people living in, in care homes where standards of care are so bad that they amount to serious human rights uh, abuses. Um, so, now the United States government, like many other governments around the world, has of course launched a massive spending program, can afford it, worth trillions of dollars, to protect the economy in the face of the economic ravages of the pandemic. But guess what? You know, the relief packages have fallen far short when it comes to protecting the poorest and most vulnerable in society. Uh, so I think that, you know, worldwide the virus has been an opportunity for countries to look at themselves in the mirror. And, and to see themselves as they really are. And many countries, it's perfectly true, face you know, similar and worse underlying weaknesses than, than the US does. But a lot of industrialized nations, like you know, New Zealand or Australia, or, uh, or maybe Germany, South Korea, and, and others, have actually come out of this looking pretty good so far. The United States, is, 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 it's not so much the case. Uh, and there's a lot that really needs to be fixed. But the question is, you know, where's the political will to fix it? And, and so the second point is about the politics in the United States. And of course, while there have been some, you know, reasonably good responses to the COVID virus in the US, both at the federal and at the state level, there's a real problem, as you suggest in your question, with, with the current leadership. There are some sort of worrying, uh, pathologies that are developing in the US political system of, of, of checks and balances um, uh, that, that, that have been, uh, again, exposed and amplified by the coronavirus pan pandemic. Uh, and in the, many, in the view of many commentators, these uh, sort of augur pretty badly for the future of US democracy. And one signal of this is uh, the president's strategy, and I think it is a strategy, of responding to criticism, criticism of his performance by attacking journalists and undermining trust in the mainstream media um, uh, in, in, in the context of a pandemic where access to you know, reliable information is vital. This is particularly uh, dangerous. Um, another thing uh, to note is the president's tendency to directly contradict his administration's own guidelines, his public health officials, and even himself. 
Uh, and, you know, while this might just seem weird, um, in fact, the aim often appears uh, to be consistent with the political strategy that he's pursued quite sort of consistently uh, in order to stay in power, namely to appeal to his political base and to confuse and polarize and sort of gaslight the nation. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, I think that there are some real sort of um, issues with the U.S. leadership at the national level. And, of course, at the international level with the America First um, policy that the Trump administration has adopted since the beginning, uh, you know, that the U.S. effectively has sort of removed itself mm. from the role as the sort of, uh, you know, leader of, of international uh, cooperation to deal with global crises. And the United Nations has, um, you know, said that this is a crisis where, you know, countries have to work together, that it's never going to be solved um, by uh, countries, uh, you know, being individual countries. But I'm, I, I'm not sure how many people would actually be convinced of that at, at, at this point, it's the countries, of course, that have locked down and put up borders and um, and, and worked alone that are, that have been more successful. What what's your sense of the role of the World Health Organization, the United Nations, um, in this pandemic? Given the, the 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 US has you know vacated the field of leadership, um, China's in a strange position given, well, the attacks of the, the president and the, the, um, the xenophobia um, coming straight from his mouth. How have those institutions stood up in, you know, their role to protect human rights specifically? Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, the UN has, 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 has obviously played a very important role, you know, since the Second World War um, in a number of areas, including um, human rights uh, and also in, in, in global health. Uh, the, the WHO is a sort of vital agency um, in, and the primary mechanism for international cooperation on, on global health issues. Uh, and it has a reasonable track record of addressing global health issues, including previous pandemics like Ebola uh, and the SARS and, and MERS pandemics. Um, the, 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 the problem, of course, is that... Uh, the UN is not, I mean, partly the problem is that it's a sort of heavily bureaucratic intergovernmental organization uh, and therefore often slow to react. But more importantly, it's only as good as its member states will allow it to be, right? Um, and, you know, traditionally it has relied heavily on, you know, a, let's say a sort of uh, reasonably enlightened kind of uh, self, self-interested but reasonably enlightened sort of position of the U.S. that it will take this role as the sort of leader of international cooperation. Um, but as you, as you say, that's sort of, um, you know, pretty much absent now. Uh, and and it's, uh, it's, so, so the U.N. Is, is hampered by the absence of the U.S. and by the emerging sort of uh, uh, competition uh, between the U.S. and China. Uh, and unfortunately, the WHO in particular has now in, the, in this crisis turned into a sort of punching bag uh, for uh, the Trump administration, um, which obviously, you know, is seeking to deflect uh, attention from its own shortcomings in handling the crisis at home. Um, uh, so I think that, you know, the, the, the sort of, if we sort of stand back a bit, the bigger picture point is that we appear to be entering into an era of um, uh, of global power competition, which makes, uh, you know, collaboration on major global crises much more difficult. Um, and it makes it more difficult for the UN and its agencies to act effectively. Um, and I think that, you know, if we look into the future where we're going to see more shocks from climate change and other environmental uh, problems, as well as, you know, continuing problems of armed conflict and terrorism, and arms control, you know, actually international cooperation has never been more important. Um, so it's a real pity that we're seeing, uh, you know, a sort of uh, a, 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 diminu a diminution of the uh, of, 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 of global leadership uh, around international cooperation. How does an organisation like Human Rights Watch prepare for the, I mean, you, you know, you mentioned two 
possibilities at the outset of, you know, that you mentioned the, the, the New Deal, what came out of the 1930s, or, 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 you know, of, of opportunities um, where in new ways of thinking economically and socially, um, the human rights uh, messages at, at the core of, say, all economic decisions feels to me like we're a long way away from that opportunity right now. But if it's there, as you say, um, or a, a, a god awful, you know, right wing nationalism, um, how does a how does Human Rights Watch prepare for the the possibilities of those kind of scenarios, or are you in fact just so in the moment of this crisis that that's for your spare time and uh, not not the job of the organisation? Uh, we can't afford we can't afford not to be focusing on on those sort of uh, bigger picture issues. I mean, obviously we are in the moment. We've been producing you know a huge amount of information, and reports, and press releases, and uh, commentary on you know what's been going on throughout this crisis so far, but obviously we're looking to the future um, and we're looking to the future in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a world of great uncertainty, including financial uncertainty. We depend entirely on private donations uh, for our funding. Uh, so uh, we need to think about that because everyone is taking a hit or most people are taking a big hit from uh, the economic consequences of the coronavirus. But in terms of the bigger picture, um, we, you know, we, we do what we always do. We kind of set our objectives and then we work out what the strategy uh, should be to achieve those objectives. So if one of our objectives is to take the opportunity of the coronavirus uh, or of the economic impact of the coronavirus to, um, to try to... Uh, come out of this uh, encouraging governments to set about, you know, creating a new New Deal, a new social contract. We need to work out, you know, how that might be done. And I think it's not actually that far-fetched. I mean, people might be uh, quite despondent in the current environment. But uh, I think there are definitely... Uh, possibilities here. There are opportunities for advocacy around creating uh, a new social contract that is framed in terms of, uh, of, of human rights, in terms of the right of all to health, to, uh, to good housing, to, uh, to water, to food, uh, to education. Uh, and the reason for this is I think that, um, you know, people have actually seen how governments can really uh, come to the protection of their citizens at a time of, of crisis. They are. They mean, they've been spending uh, trillions of dollars on, on uh, measures to protect the economy, to, to, to invest in the, in the health service, uh, to protect jobs, to protect, um, uh, to, 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 to protect the social fabric, if you like. Uh, and so they've seen what they're capable of in a crisis, and it's likely that um, just as happened after the Great Depression, they'll want that to continue once the crisis has abated. So I do think that there are real opportunities here. Of course, there are obviously menaces as well. There's the, the, the threat of uh, the rise of populism and how the economic impact of this could be very negative in, in, term, in terms of the political um, situation. I mean, just saw how the... Uh, the 2008 uh, financial crisis was actually one of the things that sort of triggered uh, the kind of populism that we've seen in the last 10 years, and some of those populist uh, parties and, and, and leaders have taken power. Um, so that is a real, a real threat, and, uh, you know, we need to have our eye on that, and we need to develop strategies to deal with that. And one of those is obviously to say to people and point out over and over again that the, uh, the the the, the uh, 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 anti-democratic forces, the the the, the anti-science forces, forces, the anti the, these populists who are so, uh, sort of so self-centered that they uh, uh, that, that they reject uh, expert advice and so on and so forth. These very uh, uh, governments that are that are led by these kinds of uh, of, of, of leaders and and part political parties and political forces. 
are actually not doing a great job in dealing with the crisis. I mean, Trump's poll numbers have gone down. Uh, uh, and I think it's, uh, it's, it's worth making that point and uh, over and over again. And I think that, uh, it, that there's a real opportunity there as well to actually uh, use the coronavirus crisis to, um, to undercut, to undermine, to point out the flaws in this model of politics. Perhaps, too, there's an opportunity in uh, you know, wealthier Western democracies, but you know, places like Australia, um, where perhaps many people haven't really thought about human rights um, affecting them negatively. That, that, I mean, one of the things that's been really present here is uh, the, the, the idea that the state can just shut you down. Um, and suddenly tell you um, who you can hug, who you can see, where you can go. Um, these are experiences that uh, most Australians have, have never um, never experienced before. Um, it's very strange to feel that. And so I suppose um, an awareness at the moment from, for millions of people that perhaps have never experienced that before is something that could be used uh, as a memory of, you know, um, this is what it feels like for the state to come bearing down on you. In this case, it's for uh, the protection, the mass protection, uh, but for billions of people um, uh, in, in time, uh, that state comes bearing down for much nastier reasons. Yes, I mean, I, I think that most people in functioning democracies like Australia or, or here in France um, have accepted uh, the need for certain restrictions. And, uh, you know, under um, human rights law, uh, restrictions are possible and legitimate um, uh, as long as they're proportionate um, and necessary and of limited uh, duration. Uh, in order to protect public health. And I think people accept that argument. Um, so I'm not sure that, um, that, that this will be a, a particular lesson in democracies. And those in, who are living in, 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 in non-democratic uh, countries who are seeing you know, abuses, um, who, who, are, who are seeing their governments using the uh, coronavirus as a pretext or a cover for continuing their, their abuses, they're just sort of and if they've become used to that sort mm. of thing. Mm. But I think that one of the things that uh, is, is interesting is, and I think which we also need to underline, is how, um, uh, you know, whether you're in a, a country in lockdown or one that is now gingerly just coming out of a lo lockdown, uh, it, that, that, that human right, a human rights respecting approach to public health in the midst of a pandemic also happens to be a, pra a pragmatic and effective approach. So let me give you an example. Uh, a, a good public health policy requires, you know, timely access to accurate information so governments can quickly respond to uh, threats to public health. Uh, so suppressing speech about public health or legitimate criticism of uh, the authorities is bad for public health. Uh, and, you know, the example of China immediately comes to mind where initially uh, there was all sorts of restrictions on access to information, and that actually helped the virus to spread. So denying people access to information about healthcare care is, 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 is bad for public health. Um, uh, you know, also shutting down the Internet is bad for public health because people don't have access to the Internet, and we've seen people shut down the Internet in the course of this uh, pandemic. Uh, another example is protecting the right to privacy. That's also good for public health. Um, so applications for mobile phones that could alert us if we're near someone who's found to have been infected by uh, COVID um, will only work if large numbers of people, you know, use that. Um, but they're unlikely to do that if they feel that their governments are going to be abusing this kind of technology uh, in, in order to create a sort of big, big brother um, state. Mm -hmm. and, and a third quick example, you know, protecting the right of everyone to access to healthcare, you know, regardless of where they come from, what their race is, what their gender is. That's good for health for everyone because the, the virus doesn't, um, doesn't respect, uh, you know, social barriers.
So uh, any population that is neglected because it's a minority or whatever can become an incubator. And once the, the virus thrives in one community, community, it will cross into uh, into other communities. So, you know, access to healthcare for everyone is good for everyone. Mm. Um, technology has been such a feature of this and, you know, whether you, whether or not you've got the internet, um, uh, it, you know, it's, it's schools, everything goes remote, what we're doing this evening, what people all over the world are, um, uh, are doing, um, but also with the development of, you know, apps, I'm sure they're, um, they must be there in France uh, as well. Uh, in Australia, there's a uh, a COVID app and about six million Australians have taken it up. What's your thought on on that um, as a, uh, a a tool in the in the fight against the virus, but as a potential again uh, for 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 human rights abuses? Right. Um, well, I think that we're talking about a number of different technologies here. There's sort of um, uh, contract tracing using data that's provided by um, tel tel telecom providers. There's Bluetooth tracing. Uh, there's uh, mobile apps to enforce uh, social distancing, to enforce quarantines, and then that's sort of big data analytics and so on. And the common, de 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 the common denominator of all those uh, technologies is um, location data that is collected on people's portable phones. The problem here is that the data usually contains quite sensitive information about people's identity, their behavior, their associations. Uh, and this can raise privacy concerns and fears of misuse of the data for all sorts of doubtful purposes. Uh, and there are also pro potential problems of discrimination um, because as you mentioned, you know, there are vast disparities in, uh, you know, people's access to uh, technology and sort of digital literacy and, and, and so on that could exclude, you know, marginalized populations uh, from public health responses um, that sort of rely too much on, on this kind of um, uh, location tracking. <clears throat> um, as I mentioned earlier, I think this is partly a question of, tr of trust. Um, there's absolutely no doubt that technology linked to phones and other technological fixes do have the potential to be of real help in, in, in dealing with uh, the, the virus and contact tracing, quarantine enforcement, uh, tracking the spread of the virus, even in the allocation of medical resources. But as long as people are worried about their privacy, there's unlikely to be enough uptake of the technology for it to be a really effective public health tool. So in order to gain the trust of populations, governments and tech companies need to uh, show that they're really sensitive to these concerns and make sure that they demonstrate good faith in ensuring that these programs are, you know, uh, equipped with the, the, the right kinds of safeguards to protect privacy uh, and that the data will only be used strictly for the stated medical um, and public health purposes and that uh, data collection will stop uh, once the public health crisis is, is, is over. The guiding principles uh, in developing and using these technologies should be that they are uh, lawful, proportionate, necessary and that they should be of, of limited duration. I mean, we woke up after the sort of the, 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 the terrorism crisis of the beginning of the century uh, to find that, you know, we were living in a surveillance society and even after the threat had diminished somewhat, uh, you know, the surveillance tools that were put in place then in the name of terrorism uh, are still there, they're still with us, cameras all over the place. And this is the next stage, uh, uh, this is potentially the next stage in creating the big brother society that I think is bad for human rights. So what then are the most urgent things um, for now, really, as you know, many countries are emerging out of the strict lockdown, um, nobody really knows what's ahead, but, but what are the what are the most urgent uh, 
um, priorities then to protect uh, people at the moment? Well, I mean, I think that um, we've, you know, that, that there are there are a number of of, of 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 big issues that have come out of this, as 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 we've um, as we've talked about, as, as I've said as several times already, that that the the, the, the COVID crisis has had a, an interesting way of really sort of uh, revealing the fault lines in society. Um, it's like every are... it's like every country has played to its character, isn't it? I mean, even Australia is a very obedient country, despite this myth that we're a bunch of larrikins. We're actually really obedient. We're the first country <sighs> in the world to wear seat belts compulsory. We're the first to give up the cigarettes. We pretty much do what we're told, and and there's a contract in that that there's an expectation that the citizens will be generally looked after, it served us very well, that characteristic for this particular crisis. It seems to be true of sort of everywhere, doesn't it, that the, the cliches, um, there's, there's truth in a lot of them um, for how each country has responded. Yes, uh, but, but, you know, uh, the, the point I was, I was getting at is, and, you know, even in Australia, you know, we, we, we've seen examples of this, you know, you know, the the, the 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 virus has given rise to some pretty unfortunate behaviour. Mm. Um, you know, yes, there's been many examples of solidarity and and cooperation and good neighbourliness and so on. But you know, take racism for example. There have been increased incidents of sometimes really violent, you know, anti-Asian racism, mm. scapegoating and and xenophobia, just on the basis that the virus originated in Asia. Uh, um, We've collected a large number of um, of incidents um, of this kind from Europe, from the Middle East, from Russia, from the United States, and from Australia. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, fortunately, the Australian government has responded with you know with the Prime Minister making very appropriate criticism of this kind of thing. In the U.S., it hasn't been quite as good. And Trump has insisted on calling the coronavirus the China virus, which hasn't helped matters. Um, and of course, this kind of scapegoating is not just limited to, to Asians. It, you know, in every country, it's exposed the sort of um, uh, racial and, and, and ethnic divisions. In India, hate speech against Muslims has grown, um, especially after the Indian authorities announced that a large number of Muslims had tested positive for COVID-19 after attending a, a mass sort of religious ceremony in, uh, in Delhi. Uh, in Sri Lanka, we've seen st similar stigmatization of the Muslim community. Um, uh, and in the Middle East, we've seen uh, scapegoating of um, migrant workers who live in these kind of, you know, quite unsanitary conditions, which have been a sort of uh, incubator for the coronavirus. Um, you know, so, you know, the, 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 we've also seen a rise in, in misogyny and and sexism. There's been a massive increase in domestic violence mm. worldwide. Um, you know, that's been a sort of hidden, horrible fact of life, but suddenly it's kind of like it's out there in the open. Um, the virus has also been used as a, as a pretext to deny women access to reproductive health care, including safe abortions. Um, uh, and also, actually, the coronavirus has exposed a sort of um, and, and exacerbated uh, a, a, an appalling, but up to now quite hidden sort of attitudes towards towards the elderly, the way the elderly are treated in 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 in, in care homes and so on. Uh, well, the, the Brazilian pre the price uh, on life, you know, the idea of of uh, I mean, there's always been a price on life. Um, it's it's not talked about, is it, in economic decisions? But the way the elderly have been. Uh, Discussed and and treated has been a spectacular feature of this. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, the, the, I mean, all, all all countries obviously are facing this this kind of balancing act between protecting lives and protecting the economy. But putting a I mean, putting a price on life may be something that's useful for risk analysis or for sort of other act actuarial purposes. But it's really not useful. Um, for the political discourse of, the, of this moment or, for, or for, for formulating a route out of the crisis. Mm. 
or a roadmap for reordering the, the, the world that we want to come out into, right? As I've, I've already, already kind of said, you know, a, a much better way is to, is, is to look at, uh, look at uh, the situation uh, bearing in mind that really, and I think this is borne out by some of what we've seen in the last couple of months, is that a human rights respecting approach to public health including respecting the human rights of the elderly, of the marginalized, of the poor, of the vulnerable, uh, is, is in fact the most also the most pragmatic and effective approach to dealing with the health crisis. So do you achieve that through, you know, what, what are the steps? How do you get that language uh, to, to remain a part of political conversation where human rights, these things that are apparent at the moment stay, remain in a conversation for rebuilding economies and rebuilding broken lives um, all over the world? Um, I, th I think it's, um, you know, first of all, you know, I think the human rights um, uh, discourse, it has now uh, acquired very deep roots in, in, um, in in, in political uh, discourse. Um, there surely have been some challenges of late um, with the rise of, um, of, of, of anti-human rights you know, movements and political parties and leaders, and some of those parties have got into power. Um, uh, even in Europe, where you have uh, you know, a, a Hungarian uh, government that is um, mm. basically assumed um, dictatorial powers um, to deal uh, under the cover of uh, and on the pretext of dealing with uh, with um, with the coronavirus. But I think I go back to the point that I was making earlier, that if we can really point out how badly those kinds of governments have managed, how incompetent they've turned out mm -hmm. to be, because to the governments that have turned their back on science, that question, you know, the mainstream media when it comes to... Um, when they when they start to kind of raise re really valid concerns about uh, about performance the, the, the performance of, 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 of these governments if we can point out how badly that model of politics has worked in a big crisis I think we're actually you know in in, in good shape because uh, as long as democratic governance continues to operate you know there is a chance that those people will eventually be kicked out of power some of the, the the democracies, though, too. I mean, it's it's been such a challenge, hasn't it? Uh, for you know, France, where you are, United Kingdom, I mean, America. Um, uh, this is, uh, you know, the, the the virus doesn't doesn't seem to care what sort of a political system uh, you have at all. And um, I mean, the, the outcome in November in the United States, of course, will be all important, I would imagine, from a human rights perspective in how that country, but also the rest of the world, the kind of lead that they're going to take um, uh, from the outcome of that election. Is it, is it as important as I'm making out or, or could I be uh, overestimating it? I'm sorry, could you, I, the, I just lost you. The, could the, you just repeat the Yeah, the, so the, the importance of the election in the United States in November, how how important is that going to be to um, rebuilding not just that country but in terms of the rest of the world and um, rebuilding, you know, human rights, getting through this crisis? Is it is it really crucial who wins that election, do you think? Look, I mean, a lot of the, the problems in the United States predate the Trump administration. Um, a lot of them are structural issues. I think what's important is that the democratic um, uh, process in the United States is seen to be fair. Um, and uh, 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 I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the bottom line. Um, uh, there has been some worrying talk about, you know, postponing the election. Uh, there have been some worrying signals in that respect. There's been worrying signals uh, in, in, from the administration about sort of casting doubt on the legitimacy of postal voting. There's the whole history of voter suppression in the United States. 
which is very concerning in the current context where people might not even be able to get out to the polling booths if there's a sort of second wave around November. But look, I mean, I think people will... Uh, I, look, obviously the coronavirus and the government's response to it, which has not been brilliant up, in, up until now, will be a, de a, a defining factor in, 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 in November. And we'll just have to see what, what happens. What would you expect to play out um, with the availability if, if there is a vaccine? Um, how the world goes about distributing uh, such a thing if it's, if it's discovered, which is still a big if. Look, I mean, uh, we, we go back to the point that we, we were talking about before about international cooperation. I mean, that's obviously going to be critical um, in, in terms of bringing vaccines to poorer countries. Unfortunately, look, uh, just last week, the, the WHO adopted a resolution promising um, international cooperation to provide vaccines at affordable prices by limiting patents. Uh, this resolution was proposed by members of the WHO, including Japan and the European Union uh, and Australia. Um, but the resolution was non-binding, and, and the US, as we know, has threatened to uh, withdraw funding from the WHO. The US had nothing to do with proposing this resolution. Um, so the fear is that, you know, the drug maker that develops the first coronavirus vaccine be it a company from the US or China or elsewhere, would monopolize the market via, via its patent. And, and setting the price too high would make it almost impossible for poorer nations um, to afford uh, the, uh, the, the, the vaccine. And, and, you know, the virus is, is spreading quite, quite rapidly in, in, in such nations now. Uh, of course, there's also the issue of access to a vaccine um, at, at, at a national level. Um, uh, in countries where the authorities are held accountable and where there's a functioning public health system uh, that can deliver vaccines according to the needs and priorities, that shouldn't be a problem. But where there's weak accountability or weakened accountability and where the health sector is mainly run on private lines, uh, there could be real problems with uh, poor and marginalised communities not getting access to a vaccine. Or you can imagine an even worse situation where you know, certain political constituencies are not getting access to vaccines um, because the government um, you know, wants to sort of punish them for their political views. Mm. Um, look, it, I've got to say, it, it, I, I, I find it hard to be optimistic uh, about the, uh, you, you know, when you, you gave those two um, possibilities at the outset, and uh, I, um, I'm pretty concerned, I have to say. Your background, Tom, is in the classics. You studied at Oxford University. Um, before our time runs out, I, I would love to know, uh, you're in France, in lockdown. Um, what, what have you reflected on from your classics um, readings, and, and what are you reading at the moment? Uh, well, um, I, I, I suppose um, one uh, classical author who, who comes immediately to mind is, uh, is the great uh, Greek um, historian Thucydides. Um, his uh, history of the Peloponnesian War between Athens and Sparta had um, uh, relevance uh, for me, when I first read it as an undergraduate at Oxford during the Cold War, um, because he has such a brilliant um, analysis of the relations between these two antagonistic states on the, on, on the Greek mainland. Uh, and it has real relevance today as the sort of tectonic plates of, of world power shift. And he also has this extraordinary account of the plague that hit Athens in, in um, 430 BC, I think, it killed the Athenian leader of the time, Pericles, and it eventually contributed to the weakening of Athens and, and then Sparta's defeat of, of Athens in the Second Peloponnesian War. Athenian power never recovered, and the stage was then later set for, you know, the subjugation of mainland Greece by the Macedonians, um, 
the father of Alexander the Great a century later. Um, another uh, of my favorite classical historians is, uh, is Tacitus, who was a, a Roman senator who wrote a history of the early Roman em emperors in the first century AD after the integration of the, of the Roman Republic. And his descriptions of the, of the psychology of, of tyranny under the emperors Tiberius and, uh, and Caligula and, and Nero are, are completely fascinating. And there's much, I think, to be learned about our current predicament for reading you know, these, these classical historians. On a more personal level, um, you know, the, medita the meditations of, uh, of uh, the Roman emperor Marcus Aurelius, mm. And I think his Stoic philosophy, you know, provide a really useful set of spiritual tools um, uh, for the world that were that 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 that, that, that was then entering the, the the dark ages, and for the world that we're living in at the moment. Although I think I'm more optimistic than you, in terms of what I've actually been reading. You know, I, I think many people have actually taken the opportunity of the lockdown to read um, Albert Camus' uh, mm. La Peste, The Plague. And each time I read this, it's, I, I, I get new insights. And for me, the message that came through this time was the sort of the, 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 the message that is put into the mouth of, of the protagonist, the doctor, uh, Ryu, uh, who says at one point that the only way to fight the plague is through decency. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, well, I think we, we should just end it on that glorious note, Tom, uh, and, and your optimism. I'm glad you are a bit more, perhaps a, a lot more optimistic uh, than, than I am. I'm feeling better after our conversation uh, uh, about the possibilities than I was before, but um, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, it's been five years since we last talked before tonight. Uh, perhaps we'll have to set another date for perhaps in five years from now and you can come back uh, to Melbourne and uh, we'll see how it all turns out. But... All the best to you and uh, our gratitude to you for tuning in uh, this morning, your time to, to give us your insight. It's been such a pleasure to see you again. It's been a real pleasure uh, for me too, Sally. And um, just, you know, uh, stay optimistic. I think that this is a real wake-up call and um, I, am, I am optimistic about the future. Good. Well, thank you. And, uh, and thank you too to everybody who's tuned in to listen and uh, if you've come in halfway or you want to go back or send it to somebody uh, it'll be uh, up as a, a video cast I think tomorrow and um, other than that we'll see you in two weeks when uh, my guest will be Kevin Rudd so uh, that will be uh, something to look forward to but Tom Porteous thank you again it's just been such a pleasure and uh, everybody have a wonderful night. Mm -hmm.